So our next talk will be delivered by Samuel here, but for this uh, arbiter. But before we start, may I just ask, ask the audience not to leave the room before uh, the talk is over because it disturbs the speaker and also yeah, the it's people who are watching it and it's not very considerate. I would also like to tell the same thing to the people who are about to come, but unfortunately they are not here. So it's, it's yours. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, so I will talk about uh, the herd in general, and in particular this morning, uh, the PCI Arbiter, which is something which was developed really recently. Uh, so I am Samuel Thibault, but uh, this is Joan, uh, who did all the work, so credit is uh, for him. Um, so the herd, basically it's all about freedom zero of free software, uh, the freedom to run the program for any purpose. And the thing is, on Linux you don't have that. Uh, you, don't, you cannot do things that only root can do and things like this. Um, so for instance, why is fdisk, mkx, 2 fs uh, etc. hidden in slash has been? Uh, I have to prepare a disk image or something. Why do you have to get the tools from has been? I should be able to, to tinker with image. Um, I have a home directory where there is room and I can store things. I have access to the network, I would like to be able to do VPNs, uh, plug the applications I want to the VPN and not the others, and things like this. And it's also freedom to innovate. Um, so if you want to experiment with the file system, uh, well, you have to patch your kernel and maybe it will be become less stable. Um, if you're on, on the machine you don't administrate, you will not be able to do that because the administrator doesn't trust you. Um, so that's really a problem. Um, maybe you want to tune your workflow because yes, you have things and the way you prefer and being just in your home directory is not the things you would like to have. Um, to combine processes the way you want, etc. And one of the things I'll talk about today is giving a PCI card uh, to a process. So you have, I don't know, a music uh, processing software and you want to give it the PCI card so it can really drive the thing as efficiently as possible, real time uh, processing, things like this, and you want to give it a PCI card. Um, it's also the freedom from software <laughs> itself. Uh, software, it, maybe you do not trust it because you, you haven't read, it the, read, read the source code, or you cannot read the source code, or you know there are bugs and you want to isolate uh, the, the program from others um, to avoid something crashing, getting everything with it. And drivers, of course. I mean, we know that all the bugs in the kernel are mostly in the drivers. So this is how it looks like. Uh, so it's really a microkernel layering. Um, so you have a kernel which only manages tasks, memory, and IPC, and the rest is in New Zealand. Um, so we have a proc server which knows about processes, their PID, UID, uh, owners, things like this. Uh, PFINet is the TCP IP stack. The X2FS uh, manages the file system. And OAuth is something people don't usually know about. It's just uh, knowing what process belongs to which UID. So this old server is related with all the rest, being that X2FS knows about USDs for files, but it's OAuth which tells, okay, this shell is allowed to do this with the file system. So it's a sort of a rendezvous point uh, for authorization things. And so it's all flexible like this. We can do crazy stuff. Um, I can refer you to previous videos uh, of previous FOSDEM microkernel room um, uh, sessions. Um, just to give some examples, if a server crashes, that's not a problem. Uh, so the computer board, the farm error we see on hard system, it's just an error. It's not something of the death that takes the whole system away. So for instance, if the if the TCP IP stack crashes, okay, all the TCP sessions are, are lost, but everything, everything else is fine. Uh, I can recover a system. I don't have network, ac network access to it, but if I have console access, then okay, nothing is lost. Um, it's easy to debug and tune. You can run GDB on the TCP IP stack on X2FS, things like this. And then you can dare crazy things. So for instance, the console 
uh, there is a Mark console which is really uh, low featured, um, but there is the Hurt console. It has dynamic font support, uh, text font support. That is, the PCI uh, VGA card only ha allows for 500 glyphs showed on the screen, but then you can <laughs> allocate dynamically which glyph you want to show, and then you can have Chinese, which has many more um, kanjis than this, but since they don't show up at the same time, then you can dynamically uh, choose what shows up. So Chinese kanjis, emojis even, we don't have to do anything to get um, emojis on the console, but just load uh, a font which has the glyphs, and that's fine. And the kernel is quite small. It only handles the task memory and IPC. Everything else is on the user land. So for instance, I have the same things I talked about. And then I have an FTPFS running as a user uh, because it doesn't need any kind of special authorization. It just needs to access the network uh, to connect to, uh, through FTP. And then there's ISOFS and a shell CP. What is happening? Um, oh, sorry. Um, it's actually basically you have mounted an ISOFS which is on a, an FTP server and then you can access to the files within the ISO image which is on FTP. And the thing is, we don't need to download the whole ISO to do that because ISO is indexed. And so FTPFS just serves the bits of the file that are needed for ISOFS to work and to provide uh, the file to CP which can get the file. So it's extremely efficient, actually. Um, so some examples uh, I have on my home FTP column, uh, which is a multiplexer for FTPFS. And so I can just uh, do, I don't know, uh, vi til slash FTP column and an FTP URL, same for HTTP. And I don't need to implement FTP in VI. It's just provided by the system. Um, so I can mount on my directory the ISOFS for something which is on an FTP server, then look at it, it just works. Uh, the signature file, I can put something on it which says each time you open it, you run fortune, and so each time you actually read the dot signature, you get a new fortune. So it's cool stuff. And one thing I mentioned, getting your, your own um, uh, environment, there's the map, the remap translator, which says you get a new shell in which slash bin slash sh is actually a pointer to home slash bin slash sh. And so from then on, all the scripts I run, etc., do see that shell instead of that shell, which might be convenient if you have, I don't know, scripts which want bash as a shell in slash bin slash sh, but the system provides dash as uh, a shell. Or you can get everything in the slash bin, which is actually your bin in which you have put everything. So this is basically the kind of things that we have with Sto, Nix, Gix, etc. Except that it's at the operating system uh, level. <coughs> so how does it work? It's quite simple actually. The idea is that it's libc which implements this. Um, so everything that happens in the system is interposable because everything is already an RPC. It's how it works from the start. And so um, you just expose what you want in the file system, in slash something, slash something, and then the user can decide what to put here and there. The idea, if you think about, I don't know, uh, fake root, ch root, for instance, um, uh, fake root is actually something that puts a library to redirect, open, uh, close, etc. so that instead of opening that thing, it opens something else. It does work enough for the use it's used for, but it's not perfect. And as soon as you have new, uh, new um, system calls, then it has to be taught about the new system calls to redirect them, to redirect them as well. Well, here, since it leaps here, then anything that will be added will be interposable that way. So actually, it's virtualization at a really fine grain interface. When you see containers, everything like this, uh, it's all very coarse grain uh, compared to this. And so the idea, as a user, you have your home directory, you have network access, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Um, so crazy thing, 
you have open a, a VPN, then your own TCP IP stack on top of it, then FTPFS, and to get a disk image which is partitioned, so you get to one of the partition, then you get inside the X2FS of the partition, and there's an ISO image, and then you open something inside it. And it is natural to do this, actually. <coughs> okay, so getting to what I'd like to show uh, today. Um, so quite recently, what we did was to move, originally we had the drivers, the network drivers inside the kernel, and that, that was not a good thing. So we said, okay, let's move it to userland so that it, ETH0 actually leaves something is somewhere on slash dev slash ETH0, so I can see it. It's not something you, you see in Linux, for instance. Um, but here we actually have slash dev slash ETH0. And what we did was just to take the Linux drivers and to put it in a process and then plug uh, here with PFINet and get it to have access to the hardware to drive um, the PCI cards. Um, so this is really nice because, for instance, uh, I know that uh, some of the real tech drivers get stuck from times to times, and apparently it's really the driver which has a bug. And so when it's stuck, okay, just kill the driver, and it gets restarted, and everything else continues to work. The PFI net stack is fine, it just opens the new driver, and all the TCP sessions are still there. Anything, nothing is lost. So it's really cool. Um, if you want to do a firewall, then just put a process which filters the, the frames between the TCP IP stack and uh, the actual uh, device, and then you have a, a firewall. Um, if you want to be crazy, you can put an open VPN on top of this and then a new um, TCP IP stack. The idea is that the system provided stack is somewhere here, and then your own stack, you can put it in your, direct, in your home directory, and with the remap uh, translator, just tell applications, instead the, the, the slash server socket 2 actually is redirected to somewhere, and then it just works. You have virtualization made easy, actually. So, about PCI. <laughs> um, the problem we have, which is not too much a problem because we are lucky, um, so the NetDD driver, so this is called NetDD, it actually accesses PCI and the network PCI cards. And for this, it has to access the PCI config space uh, when it starts. But then if you start XORG, XORG will need that as well. And then if you start a ramp uh, daemon for getting sound, then you need that as well. Uh, so the list can continue. So we need something uh, to make that safe because uh, PCI config is not something which is threat safe, con concurrent safe. Um, so for now it's fine enough because GNUMA starts first, then uh, NetDD, and then, Net, uh, then XORG. So it never happens that they actually work together, but quite soon we will have something like this happening, so it's not a good idea. So the ID that was implemented by Joanne was to have a translator uh, that provides the PCI config uh, access. And so you'd have slash servers slash PCI slash the path to the device, so the PCI domain, PCI bus, device, function, etc. And then when you open the file here, then you can use RPCs to read, write, configuration things, and get the device regions to access the memory, get the, the ROM uh, to, to map it so that uh, the drivers can work, etc. And so basically, that was enough to implement libpci access and PCI utils backends. So that way, anything that uses libpci access, for instance, XORG uh, and things like this, just transparently uh, access the, um, uh, the PCI arbiter, and they can run concurrently. So that's good. Um, so we have this. So we have the PCI arbiter, which lives in userland, which provides access to uh, so NetD, NetDDD for the network, and then XORG, which is started, and then a rump uh, daemon for uh, sound, so PCM. Uh, for instance, for my Firefox opens a network and emits to XORG and plays uh, the sound at the same time, and W3M just uses the network. Um, okay, good. 
But then we can go further. Accessing PCI cards as a user, while we are at it, we have files in slash server slash PCI. Uh, maybe I can switch mode a file and then provide access to a user, to, to, the, to the device. Um, so just uh, change the permissions. You can say, okay, on server's PCI, you say your ID that is allowed to access to this PCI card. So you can do it on the fly by using FCSOPs, or you can use Setrons to record <coughs> that on the file system, so it's always that way. And then uh, the user here can access uh, to get read-write uh, config, etc. cetera. Um, so for now, one thing which I mentioned, so get dev regions, get dev ROM, for now these only provide the address. And then you have to open slash dev slash RAM to access the actual memory, and you have to be root for this, for now. Uh, one thing we would like to do is to make, to add operations here so that um, the user will just mmap the uh, device there uh, to get the actual uh, resources, the memory of the PCI card, things like this. And some PCI cards are not only driven by memory, but also IO ports, the old IO legacy IO ports. Uh, the funny thing is GNUMA does implement uh, the notion of token which allows to access to a given set of IO ports. So the idea is that p the PCI arbiter would create a token, would tell the kernel, please make me a token that allows to access to these IO ports, which are the ones uh, that access the card, and then I can give it to um, a program. And then it can use it to, to access to the IO ports so that we can have this. That is, we have the PCI arbiter which has to be root to access the actual uh, hardware, and then everything else can be run as nobody. Nobody on the herd is not a UID, it's really nobody. It's processes which don't have any permission. Uh, so for instance, the NetDD driver can start maybe as a user which is allowed to access network cards, so it opens uh, the network card with the PCI arbiter. When it, once it, had, it has done this, it has the permissions, it can uh, forget about its permission, it tells um, the system, remove any of my permissions, and then it cannot do anything else than just driving the PCI card. So that's extremely safe. And same for XORG, for the RAMP driver, etc. And then everything here we don't trust it, that's not a problem. It cannot do much harm. It cannot even open a file. So that's fine. Um, maybe I can even move uh, my ramp sound daemon uh, to a user. That is, this is controlled by the administrator of the system. So it provides drivers for the hardware, okay? But maybe the user said, I would like to drive the sound card myself because it has special features, experimental features, etc. So I would like to run this as a user. Okay, why not? But that's dangerous. Why? Because PCI cards can do DMAs to anywhere in the physical memory. But you have IOMMU, which allows to prevent this kind of thing. Uh, so you actually control, you say this card can only access to um, that part of the memory, and then it becomes safe. You just allow the user to access the memory it owns, and, and that's all. So if you know about PCI pass-through pass with hypervisors, that's the same um, uh, feature. And it's just at the shell level. Instead of hypervisor, you have to configure something, etc. Here, you just configure it uh, in the shell, and you have access to the PCI card. And... Um, Maybe you, don't not, you do not want to give the whole PCI card to the user because others would like to use it. There are quite uh, a few uh, high-end cards like Cisco cards or things like this, um, which actually provides various functions. You have just one Ethernet card, but when you do LSPCI, you see a lot of functions. It's just virtual cards that you can assign <laughs> to different domains on a hypervisor um, system. But on the HUD, it would be on different users. So each user has access to the same card, and they are just isolated one from the other. And you could even go further. 
The thing is, you're a user. In, in that situation, if you don't trust this code, it's a problem because it, it can open files, your own files. Maybe, I don't know, um, the, the passwords you have stored in Firefox and things like this. So you don't trust that code. Okay, just start a subherd. A subherd is something that you can start as a normal user, which gets completely separate. It has its own notion of users, and then it cannot access the files you can access. So I have W3M, which I trust. Okay, I like it, and I know it's small. Okay, fine, I trust it. But Firefox, well, it's big, it has Flash, all these things. I run it as a separate user, and the driver as well. I run it as a separate user. The idea is that to, to be able to do this, I actually nest the PCI arbiters. There is the system provided one, uh, which the user is allowed to access, only the sound card. And then the user starts another PCI arbiter in which it, it says, okay, this sub-user is allowed to access the soundboard, and only that. And maybe something else uh, will uh, do not provide access to it etc. So this is a way to be able to run untrusted uh, code safely as a user even. Okay, so that was for the PCI part and now the uh, news about the herd. So the, statu the status hasn't changed so much. Um, so we support 32-bit. Uh, we have a support um, starting of 64-bit uh, support, um, which hasn't moved so much recently uh, because we have so many things to do. Uh, it's not so much a priority. Um, for now, we have two 632 Linux drivers. We would like to use uh, RAMP to get newer drivers, of course. So we have XORG, we have HCI, so that's fine enough for most hacking use, not um, desktop use, but that's fine enough for having fun. Um, we have an experimental sound support through userland RAM, so you start M player, and actually it starts a kernel with the sound drivers, and then it drives the, um, the sound uh, device. So um, we had a talk about this um, last year or two, year, two years ago, I don't remember. Um, we don't have USB yet, but again, it's a matter of taking RAMP and then plugging things and that should be fine. Um, so it's quite stable. The thing is, the boxes I maintain for an, a building package, etc., I don't remember when I reinstalled them. More than a decade, probably. I, I don't even remember. So yes, uh, it's quite stable. And the build demons, they keep building packages. It's something which is really intensive. You keep uh, copying files, compiling things, downloading stuff. So it's really stressing everything. And we don't get hangs or memory um, um, issues, etc. after weeks of doing that all the time. So yeah, it does work quite well. It does crash has hangs sometimes, but it's not so frequent. Uh, we have a lot of packages from the Debian archive. Uh, so it goes up and down depending on uh, new things that are required and things to fix. But basically, uh, we are around 80%. Uh, uh, help is really welcome to make that figure uh, bigger. Usually, it's just a matter of fixing a few lines of code in, in the software because they assume Linux or they assume if it's not Linux, it's Windows. Yeah. But, well, um, we have some of uh, Firefox, Numeric. I mean, big software do, do work, actually. We have the standard Debian installer, so it's actually as easy to install Debian Herd as it is to install Debian at all. So that's fine. Some more recent news. Uh, we have Gix, which is going quite well. So purists, I mean GNU purists, are happy because they have a real GNU, GNU, only GNU system. Um, the nice thing is it's actually bootstrapped from scratch. And that is, they have the rule to starting from a C compiler on Linux, build a cross builder, etc., and then build from scratch the whole system from a, an existing uh, Linux system. So we can trust that thing uh, quite a lot. And it helped us in Debian uh, for the rebootstrap effort to be safe, saying, okay, we can also reconstruct the Debian um, architecture 
uh, GNU Hard Architecture from scratch if it would ever be necessary. Um, so I think there is some work to do so that it's actually bootable, but yeah, people are hacking on it and it's going uh, quite fine. So recently, I didn't mention to it, um, the translators, so slash servers, socket, slash servers, PCI, etc. Uh, it's actually special files and so far we used a GNU herd <coughs> extension to store them. Um, recently we put some code to use XATTR, so to use a standard feature of X2FS to actually store uh, things. Um, we have optimization, stabilization, so uh, quite a few things. I won't detail everything. Um, but basically, we got the, the Futex uh, implementation, which provides uh, really nice um, performance. Um, we have high MEM support. It was quite something, uh, because we are still with a 32-bit kernel. Uh, so to access more than 4 gigabytes of memory, you have to, to map memory on the fly, etc. This was implemented. So OK, for now, we, we, we can access more than 4 gigabytes of memory that way. So we are fine uh, on that front. Uh, I mentioned the subherd to say a user can start something and be sure that it's isolated. So this is something that one can really do now. Uh, before, we had to be root to run a subherd, so a different set of notion of users. But now we can do it as a user. The really cool thing about this is that you can really think about containers when you think about subherds. The difference is that from the ground, it's safe. Because actually, it was difficult to implement because it's safe. It's deep inside the construction of subherds that it is safe because it cannot be uh, not safe. Instead of Linux, which keeps saying, oh, for containers, we forgot to isolate the sound card. Or we forgot to isolate this part and that. I don't, I don't know where it, it will end, because there will be always somebody which adds something to the Linux kernel which needs to be contained. While on the herd, it's not so easy to implement something, because from the start, it's contained. And so you cannot uh, do something unsafe. Um, we've worked on uh, using the LWIP TCP IP stack, because for now, we use an old uh, Linux stack, which is fine enough. but. OK, let's get something which is maintained and put it in, uh, in a process. And there's somebody who, who also worked on distributed systems. So you do PS, and you see all processes running on your machine, but also another machine. They have a coherent view of what is a system. Uh, for now, it's really experimental. But you could think that you can migrate a process from one to the other, and everything works fine because Everything is interposed, so you, so you just need to push the messages through the network to get uh, things working. Um, we had releases, so there's that old one, which is still fun. Um, we, had, we used to have Arc Herd. Uh, it's not really active nowadays. Um, we have releases, upstream releases from time to time, and we have Debian snapshots. So we had last one uh, one year ago, and Within one year, we will have another one uh, normally. So we have stable sets of things you can have a, uh, a try. So future work, um, I think the, the, the one thing that we would like to have a look at is drivers to get support for sound, USB, etc. But going through RUMP, uh, as Jane Lucas said, RUMP is something which is maintained, which is mainstream, which is flexible, and we should really leverage uh, this. So it's just a matter of plugging things, fixing a couple of uh, compilation issues, and it should be working fine. And with the PCI ar arbiter, it's fine to have the disk network, etc., et in separate processes. So if one crashes, no problem. Um, so 64-bit support, sometime maybe. A read ahead is still missing, so the performance may not be so good. But well, for now, it's fine enough. But yeah, at some point, we, we, we should really work on something. Uh, and then there's the crazy stuff. Uh, so for instance, somebody said, well, the startup scripts, it'll all, it's all in C, it's complex. You could do this in Scheme, and then everything from boot up to uh, the shell would be in Scheme. Why not? I mean. The, the idea of the herd is that it's flexible and the, you can dare crazy things because you can plug things together. You just have the file system to plug things together. So 
you're welcome to uh, have uh, any kind of hack you would like to have in, in the system. So thanks for listening and everybody that works on this, uh, I really welcome help uh, because there's a lot of things I have to do just to maintain the system so that it works uh, stably, etc. Uh, I would really like to welcome help. For instance, the 64-bit support is still paused just because I don't have uh, the time to do it because I'm working on something else. So if people want to have 64-bit support, then help me with that stuff I have to do, and then I'll have time to do the 64-bit support. So thanks, and I welcome questions. Do you mean running pa Apache? No, no, Apache. There are Apaches on yeah. the Linux kernel that have been published a few weeks ago, few month, one month ago, right now, to mitigate... Ah, uh, you mean Meltdown and Spect? Meltdown and Spect? I'm wondering how different the situation is this world. So Meltdown and Spect are really awful in that... Um, I mean... Question? Yeah, so the question is, would it be easier to patch against Meltdown and Spect on the herd? And the problem is no, because uh, here, managing memory is uh, relying on the CPU to do things. Um, the thing is, it's always a problem of performance versus security. Ideally, the kernel here wouldn't see anything, and any memory, and it would always copy from here to there, and then from there to there, and then what you would be able to see would be, with Meltdown, would be only uh, what the kernel sees, that is, the message is currently being transferred, so not everything, so that would be less of a problem. Uh, but for performance, we prefer to make the kernel see all the memory so it can copy directly from one process to the other. And then with Meltdown, you can see everything then. So yes, Meltdown is really awful in that you cannot trust even the hardware, the isolation between processes. Okay, then we screwed. Yes? Contributing and getting help. What I found from the uh, the contributing pages on the herd website is there's a lot of kind of pastes of IRC conversations and mm. you know, not very much kind of description of tasks and some of those new to the project who get involved. Is there somewhere that you know, I could find a good description of a, a project? To so, so, so the question is about the contributing page on, on the wiki. It has some things, but it's not so easy. Um, the thing is, there are so many things to do. Uh, I could spend time on doing this. I welcome people <laughs> doing this uh, for me. Um, I agree, it, 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 it's, it's uh, like a bottleneck um, to get people to do some things. That, well, one issue we have is that people come and say, what can I do? And the answer is, what can you do? In that, what, what, what are you able to do? and what, what you are willing to learn to do. And these are really different things which uh, make what you can actually do then really different. So on the contributing page, there, there are a list of small hacks. They are not so small in that. It means, I don't know, um, for somebody who knows what he's doing, maybe uh, a few days. Uh, for somebody who doesn't know, then it will be a few months because he will have to learn a lot of things, but that's that's cool because I mean, really, almost everything I know about operating system, etc. What gave me a job uh, in in in, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom and, and things like this was because of things I've learned due to pet projects. So, yes, there is that list of small hacks you can have a look at. If you don't understand, then ask uh, on on the mailing list. Uh, we can describe what what's required, give pointers, etc. Uh, the idea is that it should be something w you would like to work on so that you are motivated to make it work. So, I don't know. But yes, we, we, we should work on that part, indeed. Yes? Do you 
said that uh, for the 64 bit support, you are also working on the 32 to 64 bit RPC translator. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, just to, to make me understand, this is necessary for being able to run 32 bit user space applications uh, uh, yeah. next to 64 bit? Uh, so the question is uh, about 64-bit uh, support. So for now, we have um, just the kernel support. The idea is that you don't so much need 64-bit in userland because 4 gigabytes of memory is quite big. I mean, when I see Firefox taking 4 gigabytes of memory, I, I say, no, it's not really normal. Um, so for now, the idea would be the kernel sees 64-bit so it can manage memory uh, the way it prefers. Uh, and then we just have to translate the RPCs, um, the, the parameters, the addresses, and things like this. It shouldn't be so hard because it's really just the layer, uh, and then everything else will work, all the RPCs, etc. And at some point, we can bootstrap a 64-bit architecture. It will be just a matter of defining <coughs> things, porting the assembly snippets, etc. That that's not too much of uh, an effort. My point was just uh, having this uh, translation is mm. an additional work to do. So switching to 64-bit user space from day one might actually save you some time. You will just need to recompile this. Or maybe not. I so e either to implement translation between 32-bit and 64 or just go native 64, maybe. The thing is, we have a 32-bit uh, um, um, distribution which exists, which we know is stable, etc. We'd like to leverage on this, maybe. But yeah, there. I mean, I m myself, I prefer 32 to 64. If somebody prefers to, uh, to to bootstrap 64, then yeah, go for it, and, and you're welcome. Yeah. J just last, last yes, last question. Yes, because we are yeah. out of time then. Yeah. Is this a general mechanism or is it uh, implemented uh, as a special case? For the so I, I mentioned that you can have a token which gives access to IO ports and, and you can give it to another process. So is it something which is general or something uh, just for this case? It is something really general. Actually, um, when I mentioned the question of a discussion between X2FS and OAuth, here, the, the arrows I put is actually a port exchange. The idea is that uh, SH actually gets a token from OAT and gives it to X2FS and then X2FS can match it with the token it got from OAT, which is a proof that this process is actually allowed to access the file. So yeah, this is something deep in, in, in the system. Okay, thanks everybody.